Whether at home or work, life is about relationships. Welcome to Small Change, Big Dividends with your host, Branch Isole. Small Change, Big Dividends shares steps, tools, and tips for personal career and spiritual growth. So please welcome the host of Small Change, Big Dividends, Branch Isole. One of the biggest concerns for parents and grandparents is always the safety of our children and grandchildren. You know, we live in chaotic and dangerous times, and our family's safety is paramount on the list of our responsibilities. Most parents rely on their school district to prepare, to prepare their staffs for active shooter procedures, drills, and up-to-date information. But what is our role as a parent? What information can we share with our children and our grandchildren to support their school's plan? What can we do to impress upon our loved ones the importance of knowing, preparing, and participating in active shooter scenarios? Coming to you from deep in the forest, near the banks of the Wachita River, you're watching and listening to Small Changes Big Dividends on the Bold Brave TV and Talk Global Network. I'm your host, Branch Isole, and you are my featured guest. Small Changes Big Dividend is a show where your questions are part of the program. So if you have a question, call us during this live show at 1 866 451 1451. Or you can mail your question by email to my website and just use the contact link. That's branchesole.com. And thanks for joining me again today. On Small Changes, Big Dividends, we talk about personal, career, and spiritual Christianity essentials for growth filled living. Each week, I share Mana'o with listeners from around the world. Today, I have a guest, and we're going to share some small changes that can pay big dividends in your relationships and in your life. Because life is about relationships, but it's healthy relationships that encourage and embrace growth. So I want to welcome you to Fifth Wednesday on Small Changes, Big Dividend. Whenever the calendar shows a Fifth Wednesday in a particular month, I'm going to have a special guest on the program. Now, these guests will not tell you how to grow your business or how to go from rags to riches or quick ways to make five, six, and seven figure incomes. They won't be sharing, enlisting, or trying to sell you a method, a process, or a program. They'll be explaining other things that happen in your life. They have ways and information for you and your family to live better, live safer, and have more fulfilling relationships. Today, I've invited a special guest to share our mic and vital information and to answer your questions about school safety. So again, if you've got a question, you can call us live and my engineer, Caleb, will get your question to us. So I want to bring on my guest, and I want to welcome to Small Changes, Big Dividends, Mr. Daniel Dusleneski. Uh Daniel, welcome. I'm going to give you a brief interview and uh, in intro, and then I'm going to turn it over to you so you can answer some questions that I know my listeners have. Daniel served with the U.S. Secret Service for over 24 years. He's written a book titled The First Five Minutes, Shooting School survival guide for administrators and teachers. It's available on Amazon, and we're gonna get into the book in a few minutes. As a school safety expert, Daniel has observed, participated in, and supervised hundreds of active shooter drills in a school system of 100,000 students. As a retired Lieutenant with the US Secret Service, Daniel also served as a canine technician with his dog, Karak. He served as a crime scene search technician and a public affairs spokesman, as well as a White House special operations tour guide. 
Daniel is a former Florida County Schools Emergency Manager for Safety and Security for the Pinellas County Florida School System, one of the largest in Florida. He was in charge of emergency plans, drills, prevention, and preparation in over 140 schools. Daniel, welcome. Uh, please tell our audience a little more about you and your careers, and especially about your book, The First Five Minutes. Branch, thanks so much for having me on. Uh, I appreciate it. It's a very important subject, even though it's an uncomfortable subject, but it's something that needs to be discussed, uh, especially in today's world. We hear all the time on the media, you know, it, it, I want to say weekly, but, you know, it's sometimes it's every couple of weeks of some other shooting that happened at a school or, or, or kids, some kids getting killed or something like that. And it's, it's just horrible. And uh, it's something that I've been passionate about for a number of years. And uh, when I left the Secret Service, uh, actually, I moved down here to Florida to just retire. I, it was time. I, after 24 years, I had enough. I thought I had enough. And obviously, after about a few months of, with an alpha personality, you just say, no, I, I need to do something. I was getting all wound up and uh, my uh, ex-wife now, but my wife at the time said, you got to do something. So I was fortunate enough to find this uh, position uh, with the uh, Pinellas County School System, which I, when you think about it, when, when I was in Washington, D.C., all the old people moved to Florida. It's just all retirees down there. No, it's not. Uh, my county was very dense. Uh, like I said, 100,000 students, 140 schools. So that was kind of a wake up call to me. And also, I just kind of I got thrown into this, meaning not that I didn't have the background to it, but it was like, well, here's here's your position, Dan. I have you have no staff. You have no secretaries. You have no one's going to help you with this. But you got to do the uh, you're the emergency manager and I want you to take care of the safety of the schools. So this was back in 2014. Yeah, 2014. So obviously Columbine had already happened and, you know, a lot of other shootings started happening. So fortunately, I had a very good group of people around me uh, who could help with budget, who could help with uh, outside uh, materials, because you always start on a security um, assessment from the outside in. And I had these people that had the budget that said, look, I can work with you. Let's work with getting these schools safer. And uh, it, it started and it was a process. And uh, one of the processes was they still dealt with codes. And there are schools out there still that deal with codes, the code red, code blue, purple, green, whatever. And I, I fought for a, a, over a year to get them away from these codes. They were so used to dealing with these codes. I said, please just speak plain language. You're in a lockdown. You have a fire, you have a gun, whatever. Speak in plain language. You're not going to upset anyone. And it's better to speak in plain language. So that was the one of the first things that I ran into was these schools dealing with these codes. Anyway, uh, back to how this all started and why I wrote the book. After I was with the school system for a number of years, I left there. And that's a, a, another story. After Parkland is when all this kind of, for me, it kind of fell apart. But I, I can answer that, and then we can go on to the book. Um, the legislation here in Florida decided that they wanted the local police or local county sheriffs to handle uh, the safety and security of the schools, uh, which I disagreed with, even though I was former law enforcement, because as you know, uh, police are reactive. They're not proactive. They just don't have the time to do that. So I, I thought it was wrong, and I said, no, I, I, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so I left and just became a consultant. Anyways, I wrote the book after Ivaldi in Texas, that horrible uh, situation there where, of course, the media did focus rightfully on the non-police response uh, where they stood in the hallways for up to 45 minutes waiting for order, waiting for, I don't know, I still don't know what, I mean, there's a 600 page report out there. And it just made me really angry. Uh, obviously, there were other situations at that school that, that happened about door locks and, and things that went wrong. Um, and my current wife, she said, look, you, you got to vent. You got to get this stuff out there. So I wrote this book, Branch, it's 77 pages long. You read it an hour and a half. I wanted a guidebook. I didn't want a two or 300 page diatribe with edge of speak in it that's going to sit on a shelf and collect dust. No, I wanted an easy, you know, just a, a book you can flip to and get your information right away something you could just pin it down. This is what I need to do. 
And that's what I talk when I talk to schools uh, and I talk to teachers and parents and students and tell them it's really very simple. Your majority of your schools should have the classroom doors locked during school time. And that was another thing I fought for because teachers out there be like, oh no, I got kids going to the bathroom. They're coming in and out. They're bothering me. Tough. Lock the door. You're already one step ahead if you have to go into a lockdown. And after that, it's, it's basically, it's just simple. It's it just, you close the blinds, turn the lights off, have the kids sit on the floor, silence your phone and wait for the good guys because they're coming. Don't listen to any announcements, fire alarms, bells. Do not open that door, no matter who's pounding on it from the outside or telling you who they are. And wait for the good guys to come. And I like to point out the Nashville, Tennessee uh, response. If you've ever seen that video, they have a video of the, of the shooter coming up to the glass doors, which were shot out, of course, uh, and then walking in and checking the doors. And as they're going along, the doors are locked. They'll move on to the next one. Locked, met, met, open, I'm going in. So it's, it was not only a good learning uh, video for people to watch this, but also for the police response, which was spot on. I mean, these guys and women did an excellent job of what they were supposed to do. So I, I always point that, point that out, that, that national response was just excellent. Anyway, the reason that the book is called The First Five Minutes is because the FBI did some data. And now, of course, it's not current because it ha they have to take time to gather this data. And they said that on average, all these active shooters take between three and five minutes. So I said, okay, well, that's the critical time because you're waiting for the police to respond. So you have to find something in you yourself. You have to find something in yourself. I know what to do. And if you not know what to do, then that's why we ask for the drills to be done correctly. So that was the reason I wrote the book. The reason that it's short is that I wanted something very concise, easy to read and, and get through. What's happening though, a branch, what I found with the number of podcasts I've done, I could speak and talk to teachers and administrators till I'm blue in the face, but you know what they're gonna tell me? I'm getting my orders from the school board. I'm getting my orders from the superintendent. I've got orders from the legislatures. So I said, you know what? Parents, and as we've seen with the pandemic and we've seen with all this stuff going on, these parents have power. And they can go in front of the school board. They can talk to their administrators. They can talk to their legislature and say, hey, I don't like what's happening here. I don't like what, what's happening in the schools with the safety of my child. I, changes have to be made. So what recently what I've done is I said, look, parents, talk to your kids. I have a 17-year-old son. And we all know how hard it is to talk to teenagers because it's all yes or no answers. They don't want to talk about it. You're not going to hear any kind of sentence come out of them. It's yes or no. I got to get back to my phone, to my videos, to whatever, my friends, whatever it is they're doing. They don't want to talk to their parents. No, no teenager wants to talk to their parents and they sure don't want to listen to them. But you need to ask them. And I mean everything from elementary school all the way through high school. What's going on in your schools with these school emergency drills? That's it. How, how are they handling these drills? What, what are you doing during a drill? Are you staying in the classroom? Are you going outside of the classroom? Uh, what, what, is, what, what is it you're doing? You know, just have simple questions. What, what is it, what are you doing? If there's something that they're doing that you're like, I, that doesn't sound right, that doesn't, no. Then just dig a little deeper. Find out how often they're doing the drills. Are they doing it every month, every couple of months? Because what happens is sometimes they'll do them quarterly and you forget, you know, you forget to ask them, you know, and usually when I ask my son, he's, oh yeah, we did a drill, whatever. I mean, it's, you know, as kids branch, you're probably, uh, you know, I don't want to say your age, but when I was a little kid, it was uh, the duck and cover for the Cuban Missile Crisis because we were afraid, uh, you know, we were going to get bombed or so you'd go out into the hallway, you'd put, you know, your hands over your head, you sit on the floor, uh, you listen to the teacher. I'm not concerned about it. As a kid, I'm not concerned about it. I'm listening to what the teacher's saying. What I want to get to, Branch, is what's going wrong in some of these drills. One of them is called Run, Hide, Fight. And Run, Hide, Fight was created by the uh, Department of Homeland Security along with the uh, Houston Police Department. They made a video. The video's old. It's like 20 years old. It's a good video, but it's made for the corporate world has a narrator over there, like a movie theater announcer, and they got the bad guy all dressed in black and he's coming in with a gun 
And the narrator says, if you can run, run, run to a safe place, call the police, whatever. If you can't, then you got to hide under a desk, in a class, in, in, in a room, whatever. And then, you know, the last one is, if it comes to it, then you have to fight. Okay. For some reason, they transfer this over to schools. And you're thinking, who in their right mind would have children fight? So even some of these school systems said, well, we kind of tweaked it. Um, we probably won't have little children run and, and we don't want little children to fight. Well, then what are you doing? You're locking down. And, and that's what all we've been talking about. So then as some years have gone by, and this just happened about probably five years ago, they came up with another program called ALICE. And ALICE is this acronym. And ALICE stands for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, Evacuate. Confusing. I hate acronyms. I had a whole bunch of acronyms when I was in the Secret Service. All these freaking, even educators have acronyms. They'll throw them out there. You're like, what in the hell is that? Anyway, I agree. Alert, absolutely. You need to put an alert out there and make an announcement, whatever. Even if it's an automatic alert, push a button. Hey, we're in a lockdown, whatever. Good, good idea. Lockdown, absolutely. Should be in a lockdown. The next point is inform. And inform is supposed to be an administrator or someone is supposed to watch on a camera in the school where the shooter is and tell everyone in the school over the PA system where the shooter is going. N branch, it doesn't exist. There are no camera systems in any school that I know of that has the existence to follow anyone around where they are. And why am I gonna have some person in there, you know, um, putting themselves exposed to talk about where this gunman is going? Then you get to the C part which is counter. Now they wanted to stay away from the fight part. So they said, we're going to counter this gunman. And how they, <laughs> I, I don't, it's just frustrating to me. How they do it is they train not only the teachers, but the children to throw something precisely at this gunman all at the same time to counter the attack. So when you think about it, and this is where I hope parents get angry. I sure as heck would not want my child to be trained to throw something at a gunman during at, uh, the, the most terrifying, worst, chaotic experience they've ever had and train them to throw something in an hour and a half. Now, when you think about it, athletes, military, police, they train for how long to shoot properly or an athlete to throw the football precisely or a baseball precisely. It takes months and months and months and hours and hours to do this. So you go in, you're going to train these kids for an hour and a half to throw what? A, a book, a pencil, a paper airplane for an hour and a half. And then let's say six months from now, there may be an incident and they're supposed to pick it up right away and be able to throw this precisely at this gunman. It just throw common sense out the window. No psychologist, no psychiatrist, no one in that mental health industry agrees with this kind of training for, for, for the purpose of that. Because not only are you dealing not only with liability, but litigation, it's just something that is just beyond common sense. The E part is evacuate. At that point, well, yeah, you're going to evacuate after the end of the incident, but you're sure as heck not going to do it beforehand. So anyway, this is what I want to put out to parents that if you hear anything about this, where your child is supposed to be throwing things at someone with a weapon, that's where your red flag is going to go up and you go, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want my child having anything to do with that. And I tell you what, I had a middle schooler. I was going to a, a physical therapist for, for my knee. And I asked the woman, I said, you have kids in school? And she said, yeah, I've got a high schooler and a middle schooler. And I, it's a middle school boy. I said, well, can you go ask your boy, you know, if when an emergency happens like this and there's a gunman on campus, if they should run out of the classroom and run to some designated area. And she went and talked to him. And the kid is probably, what, eight, nine years old? He goes, Mom, why, why would I run out in the hallway if there's a gunman out there? He says, I'm going to stay in the classroom. Says, Thank God. Let me put this kid up on the stage or something because it's just, it's just, I don't know where common sense went in this kind of thing. But Branch, I'm telling you, educators and law enforcement, it's like oil and water. It's a different mindset. And that's why I want to get parents involved to talk to their children 
and find out what's going on. And if you have to go in front of a school board, it's a three minute thing. I know it sounds like not like a, a lot of time. You get a page and a half and you talk fast enough, you're going to get your point across at these school board meetings. So that's my main point that we want to start with that if you don't feel comfortable with what your child is being trained to in these drills, yeah. make, make some noise. Speak up. Speak yes, up. Yes, absolutely. Speak up. All right. A lot of information we got to unwrap. Um, we're going to take our first commercial break. I appreciate everybody being here today. You're listening to Small Changes, Big Dividends on the Bold Brave Media, TV and Talk Global Network. I'm your host, Branch Isole, and we'll be right back. Welcome back. You're listening to Small Changes, Big Dividends on the Bold Brave Media, TV and Talk Global Network. I'm your host, Branch Isole, and today I've got a special guest and we're talking about school safety and active shooter situations. And Daniel, you gave us a lot of information. As you were talking, I wrote down a couple of key words that I'd like you to sort of react to because I'm thinking about what you're describing. You know, and a school day is chaotic enough mm -hmm. just with what's going on and what's supposed to be happening. And then we've got these kind of situations that, that arise. So... The first one I wrote down was this disconnect that you mentioned between the police departments and the school district. And I'm going to assume that most school districts do not have a, a lead person like that, like you were, right? Um, there's nobody there who's really focused in on coordinating what do we do in these kind of situations. Is that true? Would that be a great assumption? Not necessarily. Uh, most of these okay. school districts uh, and some of these states will have an emergency manager or will have a school uh, um, emergency manager person that's a civilian. Uh, for whatever reason, Florida decided not to do that, and they were going to have the, the county police in charge of this. So it's, I don't know about other states. I do know in Florida that was legislated that way. But most states do have a civilian uh, person that deals with that. Now, the problem is how big of a staff do they have? How often can they go visit these schools? And, you know, I, I was never a desk person. I mean, a, a lot of them, I understand if you're busy enough, you would do table talk or you would do a Zoom uh, call like this to most of the schools. I didn't agree with that. I wanted to show up in person. I wanted to see what they did and see what, how these drills reacted because I learned from the Secret Service when there was an issue, you fixed it. So you have to go to these schools. And I had a number of schools that, uh, you know, minor things, but things that would affect them. I mean, would go and half the school couldn't hear the PA system because the speakers were out. Or they used the old system where they took the microphone on that big board. They took the microphone off, you know, and nowadays it's usually through a phone. You just put it on the phone system. Well, the phone system would be down or something what else would go wrong. Or you had a substitute teacher that day and they forgot their keys. It stuff happens. And I said, this is fine. This is why you drill because you're going to find out stuff that's wrong and you fix it. That's all. So, you know, it, the, the idea uh, is that, you know, I like the idea of having civilians doing this. Again, I'm sure the police are, are well qualified, but they just don't have the time yeah. to, to go through this. So, um, yeah, it, it's, yeah, I, I, it, most places do have someone who's designated uh, for that purpose. So as a parent, First, my responsibility is to find out what this, what the situation, how this, how the system responds. Right? I need to know the procedures and the protocols and and what's actually trying to take place. And then, if I have questions, should I try and reach out to this person who's the uh, emergency manager person at the at whatever level they're at, but uh, also with the school in mind. I need to keep them in the loop of what my concerns are. Yes? Correct. If you go to the school's website, fortunately where I am, you can go to the school's website and you can check on school security uh, or administrative security. They'll have someone there listed. If they don't, then obviously call you know the administrators at the school and find out who the person is. It, it, the, what happens is, Branch, having worked in that system, they will give you an answer that sounds like it's correct and sounds like they're doing the right thing, but, and then they just kind of trail off, like, you know, they won't get real specific. How, and that's what happened here in, in my district. They went to what's called options-based training. 
So options-based training, and a lot of schools are doing this. They wanted to get away from just locking down. They said, well, we have to do something different. Everybody has to do something different. Well, options-based training means if there is an incident or an event, they give the teacher the responsibility to make the decision on whether to stay in the classroom or to run out of the classroom. So now can you imagine if you're a teacher having that burden, you know, this horrible burden where you have to make a decision like, well, I don't know where the gunman is. Should I run or or should I stay here? It's like, oh, my God, the liability, just the, you know, most teachers, all teachers, I didn't sign up for this. What the heck? So and the other thing is, and I deal, I say I deal, I concentrate more on the elementary school kids. Only because obviously they're the most vulnerable and you have a class I mean, most classes that I have here in Florida, 25 to 30 kids. So now you're dealing with, you know, I, I want to say, you know, a bunch of cats that you're trying to gather up and you're going to run them out of this classroom to what you have no idea, idea what kind of danger they're facing. Uh, you don't know where the gunman is. I don't care if they even tell you where the gunman is. There might be another one out there. I'm not going to bring kids into a hallway hearing horrible sounds hearing screaming, maybe seeing blood, maybe seeing bodies. I don't know. Why would I put them through that? I'm perfectly safe in, in, in a locked classroom. There's only been one incident. And this entire stuff that's been happening with all these school shootings, there was one incident in Red Lake. I think it was Red Lake, uh, Michigan. It was a uh, Native American in, uh, reservation where the shooter came in and tried to shoot out a lock. He shot at it with four times of the police shotgun after he, he killed the policeman and stole it from him. And then he bashed through a window. That's how he was able to get in. But that's the only time because it takes too much time to sit there, try to you know, shoot out a lock to get into the, into the system. So you're perfectly fine inside his classroom. This idea that they're sitting ducks, that's to play the devil's advocate. Oh, they're sitting ducks. You can't have them do that. Really? You can have them run out into the hallway and, and, and God knows what's going to happen there. And you know what? There's not just one classroom running on that hallway. There is multiple classrooms. And what's going to happen to that exit? You are going to trample each other. You're going to pile up at the end there because during the drills branch, what do they do? They're walking. Let's walk quietly. We're walking down. We're walking down. We're what? During an incident, what's going to happen? Absolute chaos and panic. I'll give you an example. Parkland High School. Majory Stoneman Douglas in, in, in Parkland, Florida. They had a drill just a month prior, an active shooter drill one month prior, okay? So now this incident happens where this individual gets on the campus. They hear shots. A couple of teachers are like, oh, it's another drill. They have no idea. While this is going on, now whether there's still not any confirmation, either the fire alarm was pulled or they think probably a bullet ricocheted and set off the fire alarm. Now you've got people in the classrooms going, are we supposed to leave? Are we staying? It's a fire alarm. We're supposed to leave. So half the school is like, we got to get out. The other half is like, no, there's this shooting going on. Complete confusion and chaos. So I, we also had a teacher that thought, oh, I hear where the shots are coming from. We'll go in the other direction. Well, they get out into the hallway and they're going what they think is the direction away from the gunshots. They were hearing the echoes. They're actually going towards the gunman. So just, I mean, complete chaos. Why in the heck did you just stay in the classroom? And uh, anyway, it's just this idea that they want to start something new and, you know, we'll, yeah. we'll give them an option. And that's, that's a litigation headache right there. Yeah, I started my professional career as a teacher during the new math debacle, you know, <laughs> and, and um, I, I understand how education the thought process goes and they swing from one side of the pendulum all the way back to the other side. It's always reactive sort of instead of a balanced analytical uh, exercise that, okay, what are the possible things that can happen? Because the other things I wrote down was a dynamic situation, a reactive situation. Of course I had panic down here. Mm -hmm. Um, I can't imagine when you see videos, you know, and, and film of people in these situations, and <clears throat> it's either total chaos and panic, or it, it's locked down. And and as I was listening to you, I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to tell my granddaughters if they should enter this situation? And I thought, well, 
there's there's four things I would tell them. You know, lock down. Most importantly, understand there's a time element here that, like you say, help is coming, yes. but it's going to take time for them to react and get there and, you know, go through their setup procedures. That, that, but you have to remain calm and you have to be patient because Absolutely. help will arrive. But, yes. you know, the more secure you can be, the better off you're going to be until that help arrives. So it's real simple things I'm thinking is lockdown. Uh, understand that time, you know, it's going to take time, but time is on your side to be patient, be calm, uh, be quiet and, and try and get locked down inside the lockdown if possible, you know, get yes. sheltered. And that's all my, my girls need to know um, is, you know, get secure and help is coming and, you know, it'll be there. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you about, and maybe this is putting you on the spot, but because of the Uvalde situation, mm. I know that that's probably been analyzed and analyzed and analyzed by the people uh, in every state who are involved in safety and, and school safety protection. Yes. Um, do you have an opinion about this armed person in the school? Uh, you know, to me, this is where the big clash in the conversation comes and there's more emphasis on, well, do we have armed people in the school or do we not have armed people? And if so, who are those people and, you know, how do they qualify? And it sort of muddies the water for me with that assumption, well, we're going to stop it and we're going to be able to stop it right away. Um, I'm just not sure the, you know, the factors involved and the responsibility and again, the legal liability of, of having some, but I'd just like to get your professional opinion specifically because you are involved in, you know, uh, law enforcement at different levels, not just the local police level, but the secret service, you, um, that's obviously an organization that has extensive training and extensive protocol, but they've got big responsibilities. So I just wanted to get your, your thought on, do we, is it better for us to have somebody in the school that's armed and even if it's one person we can't uh, protect all of the entrances but what do you think yes absolutely uh the one thing nice about florida again the legislature's got enough budget to put armed special resource officers in the schools now because of this again the thing with the blm and the movement and the defund the police movement there was pushback from students that did not want these school resource officers in the schools. Even though you explain to them, they are not there to arrest you. They don't have arrest powers. They are there to act as an advocate. That's it. They're an advocate between the administration, students and parents, and they are a vital, vital resource. These people go through intensive training and they are a vital resource, absolutely, armed, uniformed school resource officers. The way they did it in Florida was, depending on the uh, student population, once you got up to a thousand students in a high school, you would have two in each school. Otherwise you would just have one. And they either are in carts or they're walking or bicycling, whatever it is around that campus. And yeah, absolute vital resource. And a lot of these schools in these states where they had these issues, where students were pushing back, it was the parents who came back and said, uh-uh, no. I want those officers back into these schools. Uh, they are a vital resource. No, absolutely. Now, on the other side, there's talk about teachers uh, being armed or going through that kind of training. And I think Utah and parts of Texas are allowing that to happen. And my whole thing behind that was at first I said, absolutely not, because as if I'm responding to something like that and I see someone with a gun, I have no idea if it's a good guy or a bad guy. No idea. And I'm going to shoot him. I, that could be the shooter. Um, but on the other side of that, if they go through the proper training, I mean almost as much as a police officer would go through, and they requalify every you know couple of months, every quarter, whatever it is, and they have updated training that they go through, if they want to go through this stuff, because you do have a lot of former law enforcement, a lot of former military that are teachers, like, hey, I want to be able to protect myself and my kids. So... I agree to that. But again, how do I identify them if I'm going in and there's an incident at the school? That's the hard part. 
I mean, are they going to put on some orange vests? Are they going to quickly put something on? No, they're they're going to the to stop the shooter. So that's the hard part. So it's something that I, I really rather would think about perception. And just quickly, the uh, Pinellas County Sheriff here, uh, his name's Gutierrez. He put out that he was going to allow the Pinell, our county, the Pinellas County teachers, to go through that type of training. And I thought, again, at first I thought no, but then I thought, wait a minute, let's just extend that a little bit. If the perception is that these teachers are allowed to go through this training, if I'm a bad guy and I'm in going into my county, in the Pinellas County, thinking, well, wait a minute, I, I don't know if there's teachers in there that have arms or not. How about I go to this other county where I know they're not being trained? It's the kind of thing I said, you know, in the front of your house, you put a sign out there. It says ADT security. Bad guy. He has no idea if you have it or not. I'll go to the next house because I don't I don't know if he's got it or not. So the perception I agree with that if there's a perception that there's the, the training's going on, let the media carry it. You know, let them let them go ahead. But as far as I know, no, there's no teachers that have signed up for that. That kind of thing. Okay. Well, that was my thought. If if a bad guy is out there, but he knows that there's um, armed resistance at a mm-hmm. particular school, that may be just enough, you know, to make him change his mind, at least for that uh, particular you know, location. Frank, I'm sorry, I wish, but that's not what happened in Parkland. Uh, that's not what happened in a lot of these schools. Um, in fact, the Red Lake incident, he just took out the guard there, was in front of, ironically, a, a metal detector. So, no, it's. I wish it was like that. But again, if, if the most recent one that was, you know, highly uh, publicized was the Iowa uh, shooting, and that individual there uh, came in, and the principal decided to counter because they went through this Alice training, this individual, and talked them down. Well, I, I'm sorry, Branch, and I, I, you know, I'm sorry for his family, but it's too late. At the point that this individual is at, at, at that point where they're they're already in, in that mindset, yeah. you're not going to talk them down. I mean, they're they're. I mean, it's they're robotic. It's just this has been planned months in advance. This is not something where the shooter woke up one day and said, "Hey, I'm going to grab a gun and go in and shoot this." No, this is months in advance they planned this. And as we know, it, the majority of these shooters are either current students or former students. And I always say, they're somebody's watching. They're watching your school. They're watching what doors are open. They're watching what gates are open. They're watching what happens between classes. They know what's going on in all of these schools. So you say to yourself, well, hell, just give up. They already know what's going on. No, no, you're not, you're not, you're not going to give up. No, the, 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 we don't want to make schools prisons. I will emphasize that because a lot of times I had a lobby area where I had to bring down glass. It looks like a bank because obviously during a drill, I'm sorry, during a drill, we had an incident where a dad who was not on the list, it was a uh, divorced dad, jumped over the counter, attacked one of the soldiers, and ran into the school to get his kid. Okay, well, I guess we got to bring the counters up and bring glass down so they can't jump over the counter. So, but when you went in, it's like claustrophobic, like, oh my God, it felt like, you know, a prison, but you get used to it. But I don't, you don't want to make schools a prison. And that's what you'll hear on most of these websites that schools want to be a welcoming atmosphere. However, You have to have a balance between securing the school and making sure no one bad gets in and yet having a welcoming atmosphere so people and parents feel welcome when they come in and students feel welcome. So it's a very tough balance. It's a a tough job. It is. Yeah, school teaching today is tough just to begin with, but you add in all these other factors that take place during the day or have possibility of taking place. And I I like what you said, the shooter has already made his mind up and Mm -hmm. and he's determined. So again, to my granddaughters, you know, lock down, get secure, be quiet, help is on the way. Yes. And, and, um, you know, keep it simple so that my children and my grandchildren don't have to uh, try to react in a panic situation. Hopefully the teacher, um, you know, is calm and, and her presence or his presence is enough. But I want my my daughters, my my grandchildren to be thinking, okay, if something happens and I'm not sure what's going on, I just need to do a few simple things. And that's get secure, get safe, keep quiet, be patient, help is on the way. And, and that's, you know, why I wanted to 
have you on today is to emphasize there's a whole lot going on out there that we as parents and grandparents you know, don't have any information about, don't have any input, and yet I don't want it to happen in, you know, in my school or my school district, but those chances of it never happening have gone out the window. So the preparation for me right. is the key, you know, be yes. prepared so that when it happens or if it does happen, your reaction is, is measured and it's thoughtful and you know what to expect and not to panic, you know, help yes. is on the way. That's the one thing, you know, I, I tell them to keep, their mantra if they get in a situation help is on the way and if you keep focused on that and are secure and safe then that's the best you can do and let those people who are the professionals who are going to take care of this situation come and do their job but i would hate to be a teacher or in the school administration today as i once was because you sort of get it from every direction and in all honesty, there's no single great answer. It's because life is dynamic and things are always changing in those kinds of situations. The panic and reaction, you know, is off, off the, out, out of the roof. It's just mm -hmm. off the charts. And uh, that responsibility for all those individuals is, is a heavy burden. So it we're is. going to take a short break. Uh, we'll be back in two minutes. My name is Branch Isole. You're listening to Small Changes, Big Dividends on the Bold Brave Media TV and Talk Global Network. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching and listening to Small Changes, Big Dividends. I'm your host, Branch Isole. And today I've got a special guest, Daniel Bielanuski, a former Secret Service agent, a former uh, canine trainer, a former uh, emergency manager for school district. And we were talking during the break and he's got something special I want him to talk about right now. I think it's uh, really an important point to bring up and for my listeners to hear. Daniel, tell me what you were talking about the credit card. Yeah. Um, I, in my book, I've got a, a credit card size credit card you can download. And what it is, it's basically a quick reference card. And I thought up this idea and basically what it has on there in small print, everything from a suspicious person, a fire emergency, bomb threat, a lockdown and a lockout, because what's going to happen, Branch, and I uh, say no one knows how they're going to react during an emergency. Um, you could drill, you know, all you want, but you really don't know how you're going to react and you're going to forget stuff. I mean, you're going to forget your name. You can feel what day it is when all this stuff is going on. So. I have this card and it's, and it's the size of about a lanyard. You could wear your lanyard because most teachers have to have some kind of ID card. Most teachers have a copier card where you have to swipe the copier to make copies. And it's a quick reference card because you'd be going through and you've, you've set everything up and you lock the door and you, and you did the windows and you, oh no, I forgot something. Just quickly look down and go, oh, okay, I forgot to silence my phone. So it's just something basically simple. It's in the book. And again, I'm not on here to sell the book. The book is 77 pages. It, it's, you know, it's, it's about awareness and the message, but I like the idea of having this quick reference card. And it's funny because I have a doctor friend who, when I mention this to her, she goes, oh yeah. She says, doctors use it all the time. I'm like, what are you talking about? She says, oh my God, they'll come up with some code purple. I haven't heard that in months. She says, I got to look up on the card what a code purple is. So just something because I've had incidents during drills where teachers have forgotten stuff, things to do. It happens even during a drill. And I understand Drilling's a pain in the neck. Everything from fire drills to active shooter drills to other emergencies, they are a pain in the neck. They take away from teaching. So if you got the card, fine, you're one step ahead. If you got the book, again, you're another step ahead for a guidebook. Uh, but this idea that how often do you drill? That's usually the question. How often should we drill? Now, when I was working with the county, yeah, once a month. I wanted to do once a month. And I thought, okay, are they really getting their – a benefit out of once a month. Is it too much? So you have to kind of balance out again. I mean, we do fire drills once a month here in Florida. And boy, you're talking about a pain in the neck. It's, it, that's kind of ridiculous. Last time they had a fire in a school was 130 years ago and hurt a kid with a fire. So, you know, once a month, yeah. If you can't do once a month, every couple of months, every quarter, at least uh, do your emergency uh, drills. Great advice. And they that's in the book, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay, perfect, perfect. 
I want to switch gears for a minute and uh, ask you, what kind of advice can you give a young professional who's out there just starting their law enforcement career, but they're interested in these specialized law enforcement uh, organizations? I, I'm sure that uh, because uh, Secret Service is such a dynamic group, they're always changing and, and things are uh, always different than what they were you know, last year or five years ago. But if, if I've got listeners who want the law enforcement career path, um, but they want to go into the specialized services, can you give them any advice? Well, I'll tell you one thing I, I would like to mention, Branch, is that it's a very noble, uh, honorable profession, number one. There's been a lot of talk about, you know, things happening with police and the media uh, concentrates on that and how bad things went or you've got bad cops over here, or bad cops over there. It's less than one percent of, of the entire nation. It's an honorable, noble profession. Uh, it's something you do get something out of it. Now, you've heard, obviously, from the media that a lot of these police officers are quitting because their uh, supervisors, they just don't they don't get the backing. So it's like, they, you know, they just don't get the backing. If you're thinking of that in a career, and I've got a, a stepson who is with the University of Florida Police. He just started out, I mean, about six months ago. And again, yes, the specialized uh, units. I was very fortunate. So you have to decide for yourself, okay, do I want state? Do I want federal? Do I want county? Do I want to stay where I'm at? Am I okay to stay away from my family or if I don't have a girlfriend, if I'm not married, to move to Washington, to move to a different area? Because if you're going to go federal, they're going to put you wherever you want to go. Now, they may give you a list of cities or towns or states where, you know, you get a choice. Maybe not, but you'd kind of throw your name, you know, your name in the hat. So if you want to go federal, I would highly encourage that because the benefits are very good. They're going to take care of you. You do have a pension. Now, you can get a pension from state also, and you can get a pension from county also. So, again, it's on your path. It's what you want to do. I didn't, I didn't think about uh, get being a canine technician. It wasn't something that I really thought about. I, I just thought, oh, that's okay. That, I like dogs, but I don't know. It's not until you get into it. Until I apply and I get into it and it's like, oh my God, this was the greatest thing. But then everything else did that was still the greatest thing. When I was in a crime scene search technician, you know, like the, they have on the TV show, the CSI, it was like the same thing. So those opportunities came. Now, I was lucky because I got in older. That doesn't mean if, if as a young person, just if you're squared away, if you just listen to what's going on, if you work hard, and I know it's, it's a cliche, but yeah, if you're just a squared away individual who is just, who just works hard and puts your nose to the grindstone, you know, I'm, I'm old school. So it just, that's the way I was brought up. Um, it was just this work ethic that, you know, you get there on time, you're on time, you listen to your supervisors, you know, it, it just is, to me, it, was, it just came naturally and I got rewarded for it. I got rewarded with rank. I got rewarded with different positions. So if what you want is, is out there, then you go for it. Then that's what you work for. And if you get rejected, okay, then try again. I mean, it, they're going to see how hard you're working. So I would definitely encourage it. Again, honorable possession, uh, uh, profession, very honorable. Yeah, I, I had a friend once who uh, was a sales trainer, and, and his, his uh, tagline was, Persistence breaks down resistance, always has, always will. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we hear stories about people who've overcome adversity and, and made it to the top in their chosen career and things like this. And not one of them ever did it out of the gate, right? It's a process and, and we learn as we go. And, and the things that you just mentioned, these old school uh, responsibilities if you've got those today, you're way ahead of a lot of other people in, in your age group or your career group. Um, performance is a real good indicator of what you do under pressure. And when it all comes down to it, every one of us is under pressure, whatever our career, whatever our job. And how are you going to respond? You know, dependability, responsibility, accountability. Those are important things to learn and more important things to use and hone as a skill. I've got another question for you. I wanted to ask you because of your various backgrounds. Can you give me real quickly a square peg round hole experience 
that you grew from? <laughs> oh, I, you know, it, it, there's a lot of them out there. Um, a lot of times you, you're, 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 you're pushing against something. I had a mentor, luckily, when I was in the Secret Service. He was a, a sergeant when I was an officer. And I would want to go out and do things in my sector. We had, we had different sectors in the city. And uh, when I worked with the, our foreign missions branch, as a Secret Service officer, we were in charge of protecting all the embassies and chanceries in the Washington, D.C. area. That was like 350 of these embassies and chanceries. Well, we would just go out, me and my partner, and do what we thought was the right thing to do. We, we would meet up with the embassy personnel. We would go through a security assessment. We were walked a footbeat. I wrote up a memo, and I said, you know what? They started this footbeat program, I think, in Seattle, Washington or something. We're, we're talking back in the 80s. And I said, I want to do that. I, I would like to do that. And they were like, okay, you go ahead and do that. So we would go out and do that. But then the sergeant would come to me and he says, hey, what have you guys been doing? I said, we've been doing what I said we'll be doing. He says, well, we got... There's nothing written here. You have no memos. You have no policy. There's nothing here that says what you've been doing. You're just by word of mouth. I said, well, why isn't that good enough? He said, no, that, uh, I've got managers coming down on me. I've got captains and inspectors and all these people. The chief wants to know what the heck is going on. I said, why do I have to write it down? And that I bucked against that for months. I said, this is ridiculous. If he wants to see what we're doing, have him come out here and watch what we're doing. I was just... I was not an administrative person. I was just like, I want to do this. I, why do I have to sit there for an hour and write something about what I'm actually doing? So that was something that was frustrating. But yes, I did finally sit down and gritted my teeth and said, OK, I will write a weekly report of what we're doing out here. So that was, yeah, that was, yeah, they pounded that into my head. But yeah, I got through it. <laughs> you and me both. You and me both. The administrative thing was a killer. Oh, yeah. Daniel, we ran out of time. I, I I wish we had more time today. Maybe I can get you to come back. Uh, yes, yeah, of course. It's been a pleasure. Get Daniel's book. It's on Amazon. The first five minutes. It's short. You can read it. You can share it with your kiddos. And uh, it, 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 look up Daniel. He's got some information that we all need for our kids. Thanks for joining me this week. You've been listening to Small Changes, Big Dividends on the Bold Brave Media, TV and Talk Global Network. Until next week, I'm your host, Branch E. Soleil. See you next Wednesday. This has been Small Change, Big Dividends. When you're ready for healthier, more successful relationships at home or work, Small Change, Big Dividends is your show. Wednesdays, 4 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave TV Network.